Hello, everybody. I'm Mary Antonia Wood, and I welcome you to Women's History Month 2024. I'm core faculty at Pacifica and chair of the Depth Psychology and Creativity Program with emphasis in the arts and humanities. I'm very pleased to have been invited to share some of my own perspectives on what leadership looks like, what leadership by women looks like. When I received this invitation, I couldn't immediately decide upon who I wanted to present. Although I knew I didn't want to select someone who was dead or someone who had been dead perhaps for centuries, even though this is Women's History Month. With this parameter in mind, I decided to go back to basics and decide for myself what this word leadership really means and who might exemplify that in the here and now. Once I got past the more common notions of leadership, I immediately knew who I wanted to spotlight for you today. My selected female leader is unexpected. She doesn't run a large corporation. She doesn't have a single employee reporting to her, and she's not in charge of a multi-million dollar budget. She's not making decisions that will affect the lives of many, nor the economies of entire countries. She's well past the age that we'd commonly expect for women in leadership roles. Although, as we've seen, men get much more of a pass on this uh, based on the current presidential lineup. She is, however, an extraordinary leader, the type of leader that is desperately needed now in our fraught contemporary climate of unchecked abuses of power and the very much related slide into authoritarianism that we're seeing in a number of countries, including here in the US. She is E. Jean Carroll. What I'd like to do now is actually minimize myself take myself off the screen for a moment so that I can show you some images that I have put together for you and continue with this presentation. So I've titled this presentation, The Audacity of a Whack Job, E. Jean Carroll's Unlikely Yet Extraordinarily Bold, Creative, Courageous, and Triumphant Leadership. Let me give you some background. In 2019, Carol went public with details of a sexual assault, which occurred 30 years prior in a department store. The perpetrator was Donald Trump. Once her account became public, Trump began to spread lies about the incident, calling Carol the liar and describing her as a crazy old hag, a whack job. Carol considered suing him and was encouraged to do so at just the right moment by just the right person. And I'll say more about that in a moment. She did sue Trump in 2022. A jury determined that he was guilty of defaming Carol and awarded her $5 million. Immediately afterwards, Trump began to defame Carol once again on social media and elsewhere. Carol and her team of attorneys led by Roberta, known as Robbie Kaplan, sued once again for defamation and emotional damage and for battery under the Adult Survivors Act. The jury in that second case, which concluded this past January, awarded Carol 65 million in punitive damages, finding that Mr. Trump had acted with malice, as well as 18.3 million for emotional harm and reputational damage. I've read many recaps of these two trials, especially the second that most recently concluded. One of the best recaps of the second trial was written by journalist Jessica Bennett of the New York Times, who was in the courtroom for the entirety of the second trial. Recapping the trial this past January, Bennett stated, I couldn't stop thinking that this trial was also about something else, the value of a woman long past middle-aged who dared to claim she indeed still had value. Just how radical was it for Ms. Carroll at 80, at 80 years old, to demand that she was worth something? End quote. This radical claim of self-worth is what I'd like to focus on when considering the concept of leadership. 
It's this radical self-worth that Bennett observed Trump's lawyer, Alina Haba, attempting to demean and diminish, attempting to paint Carol as a, quote, faded careerist whose rape claim was a last-ditch effort to reestablish her career. According to law professor Deborah Turkenheimer, who Bennett sought out for her article, Trump's legal team was trying to show that Carol was already past her prime and that she had, quote, withered on the vine, and so whatever was left of her wasn't enough to warrant a hefty damage award. There's no precedent for a case like Miss Carol's, in part because it's so unusual for a woman her age to come forward. Part of that has to do with the stigma of sexual assault and the stigma of age. Carol was 52 when she was assaulted. But it makes it all the more radical that an 80 year old woman proclaimed that she wasn't done yet that her reputation was something worthy and that she was owed money from the person who trashed it. Bennett considered the ageism at play in this entire situation. And she concluded, Bennett concluded, that Carol's age and the wisdom and confidence that comes along with that allowed her to make the genuinely audacious claim that an 80 year old an 80-year-old woman still had good, creative, vivacious, maybe even profitable years ahead of her. I want to note before continuing that I considered presenting one of the influential and inspiring women of color that I bring into my courses at Pacifica, such as Gloria Anzaldúa, Bell Hooks, Toni Morrison, among others. But there's so much about Carol's story that has captivated me. It's so immediate and so mythic. It reverberates with archetypal themes, underdog versus tyrant, the heroic versus the monstrous. History is being written right before our eyes. A mythic tale is coming to life right before our eyes. Criticisms could be leveled that Carol is a woman who possesses various types of privilege. She's a white woman of moderate stature in journalism even though she was fired from her longtime job at Elle magazine when she accused Trump of sexual assault. She's someone whose social life, even in her 70s, included attending parties where prominent political commentators would mingle with other well-connected and successful individuals. It was at the home of political commentator Molly Jung Fast where Carol met the attorney and political pundit, George T. Conway. It was Conway who introduced Carol via a two sentence email to the brilliant attorney, Robbie Kaplan, whose previous high profile cases include a legal victory on behalf of gay marriage argued before the Supreme Court in 2016. These are aspects of who Carol is aspects that contributed to her triumph over Donald Trump and her team of attorneys that surrounded her in her two trials. But Carol isn't a socialite with a trust fund. She's a twice divorced single woman who's worked all her adult life to support herself and she's still working. She's also something that our dominant American culture abhors, something considered to be a terrible detriment but which in the end became one of her greatest strengths. She's an old woman, an unapologetic elder, some may say hag or crone or witch, who dares to still value herself, to fight for herself in a culture where old plus woman equals invisibility and powerlessness. The hag, the witch, and the crone are archetypal figures that have come to life in this still unfolding drama. But rather than focus on those figures, I want to show parallels with a more subtle and lesser known figure, the Greek goddess Metis. Metis was one of the Titan goddesses. She was Zeus's first wife and the mother of a much more famous goddess, Athena. 
As the various myths tell us, Metis was the wisest of the Titans. In fact, her name means wise counsel. For the Greeks, a medic consciousness was highly valued as it implied a certain kind of cunning intelligence, flair, resourcefulness, vigilance, and wisdom that comes with experience. This type of savvy and strategic intelligence allowed Metis to concoct the potion that put the Titan Kronos to sleep so that Zeus could rescue his siblings and receive all the credit, by the way. Zeus, like many powerful patriarchal figures in myth and throughout history, benefited from Metis' wisdom and strategic leadership, even as he was paranoid that she would outshine or outmaneuver him. So he outmaneuvered her first and swallowed her before she could give birth to any offspring that would pose even greater threats to his power. Unbeknownst to him, however, she was already pregnant with Athena, who, as the myths tell us, was born from Zeus's head, fully armored and ready for battle. Metis's brand of wise, strategic leadership became part of the common characteristics that have been attributed for centuries to both Zeus and Athena. Another aspect of Metis's character and of Metic consciousness is the ability to appear in unexpected forms to keep an opponent off guard. In addition, Metis's training in preparation of her daughter, Athena, to assume her role as the premier Greek goddess of wisdom, strategy, and battle, not only confirms that Athena actually was born of her mother before emerging from her father's head, but underscores the importance of women mentoring, initiating, protecting, and teaching other women. We can see all of these dynamics in the relationship between E. Jean Carroll and her attorneys, especially the relationship between Carroll and her lead attorney, Roberta Robbie Kaplan. Inspired by Metis, the image that you're looking at in this slide is a mixed media collage that I recently created as a part of a series of shape-shifting wise women wizards who are both protecting and instructing the next generation of wise women wizards. Look at these two images. The juxtaposition is particularly striking. On the left is Carol, flanked by her two attorneys, Robbie Kaplan and Sean Crowley. On the right is a fifth century Roman marble reproduction of an earlier Greek bas-relief of the Three Graces. Although separated by two millennia, we can feel the affection and the power of women united in solidarity as they join hands and join forces. I'm not suggesting that Carol is a fearless warrior or a typical warrior at all, and that a lack of fear contributes to her leadership. Quite the opposite. She was terrified throughout the two trials especially when she had to face Trump himself in court. But once she did face him, her fear was transformed. Let's hear her briefly describe this in her own words. Four days before trial, I had an actual breakdown. I lost my ability to speak. I lost my words. I couldn't talk and I couldn't go on. It was, that's how frightened I was. But oddly, we went into court. Robbie took uh, the lectern. I sat in the witness chair like this. And she said, uh, Miss Carroll, good morning. Would you please spell your name for the court? And amazingly, I looked out and he was nothing. He was nothing. He was a phantom. It was the people around him who were giving him power. He himself was nothing. It was an astonishing um, uh, uh, discovery for me. He's nothing. 
We don't need to be afraid of him. As a way to sum up some of the reactions to the verdict in her trial, which underscores some of the mythic and archetypal themes that I've presented, I'm again recalling Jessica Bennett's article for the New York Times. Once the verdict in the second trial was read and the courtroom was cleared, Bennett accompanied Carol's sister to a celebration at Kaplan's office. Riding in a taxi through the streets of New York City, the two women scrolled through social media to gauge reactions from the public and from various news outlets. Comments from the public included, hero, an inspiration to women, finally accountability, and then predictably, deranged old hag. The difference from just a few moments before, recalled Bennett, was that they could laugh about it now. I was also struck by attorney George T. Conway's comments after hearing the verdict as he described in his article for The Atlantic. He stated that tears welled up in his eyes when he heard the news of the verdict and that he'd never been more emotional about a case in his entire life. He points us to the archetypal underpinnings of this case when he explained, quote, this case was a one act in a morality play, was a single act in a morality play of immense significance involving not just one man, but an entire nation, a larger drama about right and wrong, about truth and lies, about justice and injustice. As I close, I also want to bring out an important parallel of Carol's unlikely leadership as it relates to my work at Pacifica and to my program, Depth Psychology and Creativity. We're a program that attracts people in various stages of their lives. Our current cohort ranges from individuals in their late 20s to their early 70s. Those students of all genders in their 60s and 70s are just as vital and engaged as Carol. They refuse to be made invisible by our culture's worship of youth and power. I want to acknowledge how much our program has benefited and how much I personally have benefited from the elders who find their way into the DCH program. Their medic qualities of hard-won wisdom, tenacity, creative flair, and courage are an inspiration. As we contemplate the meaning of leadership during Women's History Month, Eugene Carroll shows us that by acknowledging our fears and nevertheless taking action toward justice, toward the righting of wrongs, we can find that what we fear or who we fear is actually something small and petty, something that in many cases can and must be confronted. We realize that fear should not keep us from taking action, even when our culture believes that we are insignificant and powerless. Like Carol, we can value ourselves enough to challenge corrupt authority, abuses of power, and insults to our dignity, even if we happen to be old and even if we happen to be women. Thanks for your attention, everyone. And now go out and make some history.